Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, and theta meditation teacher. Above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on a quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What life is all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. Welcome to the brand new, exciting season four of Quantum Living. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Today's episode departs somewhat from our regular place at the intersection of science and spirituality, but perhaps not completely. It is more about the science of achieving and maintaining good health, but I'm sure that mind over matter plays an important role somewhere here as well. As you may know, I have a strong personal interest in health and nutrition, and after all, Quantum living is a healthy living. (laughs) And so today I have decided to talk about the amazing benefits of water fasting and have invited the best expert in this field one could find to help me unpack this intriguing topic. Unlike many fat diets, from grapefruit juice to potatoes to keto, and many of them do have their own merit, by the way, water fasting is the only biologically natural diet for our body encoded in our DNA. We have records of water fasting being used as a key remedy for many ailments since the earliest history of the human civilization. And of course, periodic fasting is to this day a recommended or even required practice in many religious traditions as a way to cleanse the mind and body of impurities and negative thoughts. When we are sick, we intuitively stop eating for days, even with flu or cold. Animals will always stop eating when sick, and so when your cat or dog stops eating for a couple of days, that's a sign that something is wrong, and it is time to take them to the vet. My underlying curiosity here is, Is fasting our biological first response to disease and imbalance in the body? And if so, why did we suppress it and no longer recognize it as the simplest, easiest, most natural and in many ways most effective cure of many health issues? And of course, what are the real confirmed and tested benefits of water-only fasting? I will put these and many other questions to my special guest, Dr. Alan Goldhammer. Dr. Goldhammer is one of the world's leading experts on medically supervised water-only fasting. He is a doctor of chiropractic and doctor of osteopathic medicine. In addition to numerous scientific papers and articles, he has written and published two books, the Health Promoting Cookbook, and The Pleasure Trap, which we will, of course, talk about. In 1984, Dr. Goldhammer founded and became director of True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California. Since then, he has supervised the fasting and care of more than 20,000 patients. I just would like to repeat that, 20,000 patients as this is a crucial data we will be coming back to in this conversation. 
Dr. Goldhammer is a frequent and sought-after lecturer and speaker on fasting, diet, and treatment of chronic diseases to achieve optimum health. And I am delighted that he has accepted my invitation to appear on my show. And now he joins me from Santa Rosa in California. Hello, Dr. Goldhammer. Welcome to Quantum Living. Thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. My pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Well, today's episode has the hallmarks of enlightenment and revelation on one hand and of the horn of abundance on the other, as I'm sure it will open many people's eyes to what can be achieved by water fasting. And there is so much good stuff we will learn and discover here, and hopefully a lot of goodness will come out of it when some of our listeners will decide to try water fasting and experience its benefits. Okay, so there is a lot we'd like to cover here and unpack. So let's set the scene for our conversation. You are a medical practitioner, a chiropractic doctor by training. When and why during your medical practice did you shift your focus from treating the health issues of your patients with drugs and therapy to the healing properties of water fasting, both as the prevention and cure? Well, you know, in my situation, uh, I never had to shift my practice because when I was a young teenager, I became interested in this concept of health and health from healthful living. So I went to school specifically to pursue the interest that I had in figuring out not so much what caused disease, but what caused health. I was interested in understanding what principles had to be applied so that you could stay healthy rather than wait until you were sick and then try to unwind uh, the consequences. And the process of investigating this led me to reading uh, some works by Herbert Shelton. And Herbert Shelton was kind of the founder of the natural hygiene movement. And he said that health was the result of healthful living, that healthful living involved diet, sleep, and exercise, and that fasting was a great way of undoing the consequence of dietary excess. And it turns out that most of the diseases that people experience in modern society are intimately tied to dietary excess. So obesity and its consequences, cardiovascular disease, in particular hypertension, type 2 diabetes, the whole host of autoimmune diseases, and many forms of cancer, including lymphoma, have been well demonstrated to be tied to dietary excess, uh, metabolic syndrome and its downstream consequences. So it's not shocking to find out that fasting uh, is a way of giving the body a chance to mobilize and eliminate the consequences of dietary excess, because we know that fasting is a biological adaptation. All human beings fast, have the ability to fast. Fasting is essentially Train, changing the fuel of our brain from its normal fuel glucose to a byproduct of fat metabolism, uh, in particular beta hydroxybutyric acid. So the human brain is our largest burner of glucose. It's this large bulbous neuronal net. Were it not for our ability to change its fuel from sugar to fat, humans could only go a very limited period of time without eating. And so you would never, for example, have seen humans wandering away from the tropics because the first time spring came late, all the humans with their large energy consuming brains would have, and in fact did die. So today all humans have this capacity to change brain fuels. And now a, a 70 kilogram human male uh, can go as much as 70 days or more without eating. Whereas uh, a, an animal, uh, that same animal without the ability to fast would be able to go a week or so. so uh, what would happen is, is once you've depleted your glycogen stores after about 48 hours, you would have, in order to maintain glucose to the brain, you'd have to go through a process called gluconeogenesis, which is the breaking down of protein. And you don't have unlimited protein stores. But because we have this biological adaptation, we can extend by tenfold or more uh, the duration of time we can go through deprivation. And that's critically uh, necessary for humans, particularly humans that are wandering around the globe and and, and leaving the, the caloric security of a tropical environment. Absolutely. So to repeat my key question from my introduction, is fasting our biological first response to disease and imbalance in the body? And if so, 
why did we suppress it uh, as the common knowledge uh, and no longer recognize it as the simplest, easiest, most natural, and in many cases, most effective cure of many health issues, apart from people and researchers like yourself? Well, I think in a natural setting, we would have worked very, very hard to avoid fasting. We would have tried to get enough to eat and avoid being eaten. In a natural setting, remember, humans evolved in an environment of scarcity. Most humans did not live long enough to reproduce. They died from predation, starvation. And so our biology was designed to get enough to eat and avoid being eaten so we could live long enough to reproduce and pass on our DNA. The problem is in in an environment of scarcity, we would crave the most concentrated calories available. And that worked great in the natural setting. Eat as much as you could whenever you could of the most rich food that was available. And if you were lucky, you would live to reproduce. Our ancestors were were the winners. They were the ones that got enough to eat. The ones that didn't are called losers. They didn't pass on their DNA. (laughs) They're not your, your ancestors. And so in this natural environment of scarcity, fasting would have come up only by force, not by choice. And it would have rarely been necessary because dietary excess uh, would have been a rare situation. Fasting was used to survive periods of deprivation. Um, Now, in the modern world, what we've done is we've learned to apply this very ancient natural biological adaptation to a very unnatural situation. And that's where humans are given unlimited access to highly concentrated foods. We can systematically overeat, develop obesity, and all the downstream consequences we've already mentioned. Fasting is a way of giving the body a chance to reboot and recalibrate. It just so happens that it works well in this this very unnatural environment. You know, this is only going to have been relevant uh, post-industrial revolution. Even even with the advent of agriculture, you know, dietary excess was a relatively rare situation. The only people that really developed the disease of dietary excess consistently were people that used to be called kings because they were the wealthy elite that could afford to eat the highly processed and more concentrated foods consistently. Average person, you know, would have uh, perhaps special treats or, you know, we had uh, feasts and holidays, but it wasn't like having Christmas for breakfast, Thanksgiving for lunch and, and uh, New Year's every evening, which is what we do today. Yeah. It's highly concentrated foods that in the past only Kings would indulge in and it yeah. would have been a rare situation. So yeah. I think, I don't know about fasting being the, the, I mean, clearly when animals are sick, you know, uh, it's time to fast, not to eat generally. Uh, But again, I think these would have been relatively rare situations uh, that people would have become at least ill from the diseases that we talk about today. You wouldn't Mm -hmm. have had high blood pressure and and, uh, cardiovascular issues. You wouldn't have had type two diabetes. These were rare, very rare uh, conditions. Now they're ubiquitous. They make up 80% or more of the people that are dying uh, prematurely and needlessly, and oftentimes through great agony and expense. People are spending 9.6 years debilitated, 16 years in poor health. Uh, I think one of the things that a healthy diet and fasting does is it gives you the opportunity not just to live to your full genetic potential, have a good life, and ultimately a good death where you go to sleep one night and don't wake up. But more importantly, you can dramatically reduce the likelihood of debility where you find yourself unable to talk or move lying in some nursing home bed, waiting for people to come and change your diaper because you've had a stroke or heart attack or some preventable avoidable condition that only comes about because you're fooling the brain into eating too much. And we do that because dopamine, which is the neurochemical in our brain associated with pleasure is stimulated by chemicals that we add to our food that fool us into overeating. For example, if you take rats or mice, and you give them unlimited uh, rat chow or mice chow, they'll get to a certain size. And then their normal satiety mechanisms limit how much they eat. However, if you add certain chemicals to their feed, they will systematically overeat. Rats will gain 49% of their body weight in 60 days. Birds will get so fat they can't fly. And the chemicals that you can put in uh, rat chow or uh, uh, mouse chow or bird chow are the same chemicals we put in human chow. And those chemicals are SOS, salt, oil, and sugar. Salt, oil, and sugar are not food. They are hyper-concentrated food byproducts. They are chemicals that we add to food so that it tastes better. And that's what tasting better is, is artificially stimulating more dopamine in our brain. So the more dopamine, the better the food tastes. 
the higher the caloric density, the more dopamine. And so what food manufacturers have learned to do is take these uh, primary carbohydrates, uh, flour, corn, soy, and add salt, oil, and sugar to them so that people like the drug-like effect that they get when they, when they start uh, consistently indulging in these foods. Think about this, sugar, which is uh, now makes up as much as 150 pounds a year for the average person in industrialized countries. Well, I mean, I don't eat any, so somebody's eating my share too, because that's an average. <laughs> 150 pounds of this chemical that is devoid of uh, nutritional benefit uh, and a source of highly concentrated calories that fool the satiety mechanism. It's not wondering, there's no wonder that we're having an epidemic of diabetes, obesity, that 70% of people in industrialized countries now are overweight or obese, that leads to metabolic syndrome, which increases our risk of dying from heart disease, cancer, stroke, uh, autoimmune diseases, and even things like COVID-19. If you look at what are the risk factors that make people vulnerable from dying from infectious disease, metabolic syndrome is right there at the top of the list. And so, you know, we have a situation that's very abnormal and all we've done is recognize this, this ancient biological adaptive process of fasting can be a useful tool for allowing people to escape the dietary pleasure trap, reverse the consequences of disease and restore health And this is so incredibly important. You have treated, as I said, and supervised over 20,000 patients over the years of your practice, which is a statistically a very solid number. When you see the same outcomes again and again, hence it is significant. To give our listeners a good sense of the health benefits of water fasting, because this is really my main objective behind this, this podcast, could you please list the key illnesses and health conditions as many as you can so that that can be eliminated or significantly mitigated by water fasting? And I would especially ask you to address inflammation, stress, and can anyone fast? So everybody fasts every day and you break your fast with something called breakfast. And so the only question is what's the ideal amount of time to fast each day? And we recommend that people, particularly people that are trying to lose weight uh, or trying to do weight management, that they fast every day for between 12 and 16 hours and that they limit their feeding window to between eight and 12 hours. By, by giving yourself 12 to 16 hours of fasting every single day, you induce hormonal and other changes that are thought to be beneficial. And cumulatively, that amount of fasting may be highly beneficial in terms of disease uh, reversal and avoidance. Now, the practical way to do that is to make sure that you do not eat three to four hours before you go to bed at night and perhaps delay your first meal or your break fast until you've had a chance to do some vigorous exercise in the morning. Uh, exercise in the fasting state uh, after 12 hours is thought to preferentially burn fat, but in particular visceral fat. Visceral fat is a subset of fat that's most associated with uh, inflammation. And inflammation, it turns out, is intimately associated with almost all of the diseases that we may be discussing today. So reducing inflammation turns out to be a primary goal and one of the major causes of inflammation and the markers associated with inflammation, IL-6, TNL, alpha, et cetera, is visceral fat. You shouldn't really have much in the way of visceral fat on a healthy person. But when you have a consistent dietary excess, the body trying really hard to store all of the caloric resources that it can to deal with deprivation that it's expecting to come, will store it and the consequences that are quite devastating. Now, the, if you wanna think about what condition might benefit from fasting, the first question is, is it a condition that's aggravated or made worse or caused by dietary excess? So obviously obesity is caused by dietary excess. And it's not surprising that fast is the most effective way of mobilizing and eliminating not just fat, but preferentially visceral fat. We've just completed a study with our colleagues at the Mayo Clinic uh, that used a DEXA scanner to analyze 
uh, body composition changes that occurred in a large subset of uh, fasting patients. And what we found was that when you go on a fast, you lose weight. Not surprising, the average is about a pound a day. Now that pound a day, part of it's water, some of it's protein, some of it's uh, fiber, some of it's glycogen, your, your sugar stores in your muscle, and some of it's fat and particularly visceral fat. And then when you come off the fast and begin refeeding again, you regain weight. But it turns out if you uh, feed properly after the fast with a whole plant food SOS free diet, the weight you regain is protein, water, fiber, and glycogen, not fat. Even though you're still losing weight, the fat continues to come off and not just fat, but particularly visceral fat. For example, as an individual that might lose 20% of all of the fat on their body in a two week fast may lose 50 or 60% of visceral fat. So they they've, lose a disproportionate amount of the visceral fat. It's as if the body recognizes that visceral fat is not an ideal substance and mobilizes that first. And then it deals with your regular subcutaneous adipose tissue. And now we looked at these patients and said, well, what happens after they're free living for six weeks and gone back to living in their homes, not just at the True North Health Center? And it turns out fat loss continued in this uh, subject population, and visceral fat loss continued, the lean tissue on those people at six weeks was actually higher than before they started fasting. They had actually, even though they were continuing to lose weight, they actually had a higher overall lean tissue mass, and their bone density was not diminished at all, despite the fact, you know, you might think, well, they had some rest when they're fasting, there might have been some pathology of bed rest. So their bone mass was the same, their lean mass was higher. The only thing that kept going down was fat and preferentially visceral fat. And now what's exciting is that's a paper that we've, we've finished. That'll be coming out uh, this year. And for your viewers, if they want to read these papers in total, these are all in peer-reviewed uh, journals. They can go to our website at fasting.org. It's a, it's a fasting compendium website of our nonprofit research foundation. And they can pull these articles. We've published uh, a large number of studies now, case reports as well as clinical trials. Uh, this particular paper, we now have one year follow-up data. So now we're getting data from one year in a population of that people that started off with obesity and hypertension. And we were able to show in this particular study, 27 of the 30 subjects at one year follow-up were still normotensive without medication. One was on medication, but at half dosing. So wow. we're showing substantial sustained results. Now, granted, these are highly motivated, self-selected people that are willing to do something like, you know, fast and eat well. So it's not necessarily random people off the street, but for highly motivated people that are willing to do dangerous and radical things like eat well and exercise and go to bed <laughs> on time, they can normalize their condition. We did a study, one of our first papers was in hypertension. We took 174 consecutive patients with hypertension and 174 people lowered their pressure enough to eliminate the need for medication. We have the largest effects that have ever been shown in the scientific literature in treating high blood pressure in humans was an average effect size in stage three hypertension of over a 60 point drop in blood pressure, not taking into account that many of these people were medicated when they started. None of them were medicated when we finished. So 60 points plus whatever effect the medication might have been having on their health. So if you have essential hypertension, what this essentially means, if you're willing to fast and follow it with diet, you can normalize your blood pressure and eliminate medication. Well, high blood pressure is the leading contributing cause of death and disability in industrialized countries. It's the leading cause for prescription medications. Um, it, and the medications don't do a very good job of reducing death. That's one of the surprising <laughs> shocks you get when you look at the medical yeah. literature. People still have heart attacks and strokes. Um, but... Um, fasting is tremendously effective at limiting the risk of uh, medications and their side effects, the chronic cough, the fatigue, the impotence, and even death. You, you, don't, you can't just give everybody high blood pressure medication. You have to wait till their blood pressure is quite high because otherwise the death rate from the hypertensive drugs exceeds the benefit from the hypertensive drugs. That was the definition of hypertension, the level at which the death rate from taking the drugs was exceeded by the benefit of reducing stroke. People don't understand, even these commonly used drugs have tremendous risk factor potentials. The statin medications, the blood pressure medications, um, 
compared to maybe making diet and lifestyle changes with very little side effects, taking medications to try to manage the effects of your dietary excess may not be a good long-term strategy. Absolutely. Could you talk about a few key health conditions which are a result of inflammation? Yes. So once we reduce inflammation, they go away, basically. Well, infl- inflammation is one of the components in cardiovascular disease in general, hypertension in particular. Um, also type 2 diabetes. So we treat uh, large numbers of uh, in- uh, type 2 diabetics. Uh, this is a situation where uh, insulin is the hormone that drives sugar from your bloodstream into the cells where it needs to do its job. In type 2 diabetics, they have enough insulin. In fact, they have more insulin. They're making more insulin than normal patients, but the insulin is not working. Um, and part of the process of the insulin not working is insulin resistance. And insulin resistance uh, is caused by a pro-inflammatory diet that makes you fat. It's not just the fat. It's the diet that makes you fat. Because think about this. You don't have to lose all your extra fat to normalize your blood sugar. Your blood sugar starts normalizing. I mean, in days, we start seeing changes uh, with fasting and dietary change. So it's the diet that makes you fat that's the real actual cause. The the excess, you can have a person that's quite a bit overweight without having insulin resistance. Uh, And the moment you change the diet, the problem begins to resolve, even though you haven't fully used up your extra reserves. if you want to talk about autoimmune diseases, these conditions where the body attacks itself uh, intimately involved with inflammatory processes. For example, rheumatoid arthritis, the deformity and the pain is because your immune system is attacking your body. And it does that in part because of what's called insulin resistance, or excuse me, gut leakage. So there, yeah, there is insulin resistance associated, but it's gut leakage that's one of the triggering mechanisms. In other words, you get an inflammatory gut matrix Proteins leak through the enlarged spaces. The immune system reacts to those. And in genetically vulnerable people, that chronic inflammatory process that contributes to the gut leakage can confuse the immune system where the immune system begins to attack its own tissues. The medical management strategy is to take powerful anti-inflammatory drugs like steroids to try to reduce the gut leakage, to reduce the triggering of the immune response. The problem is it turns out you need your immune system. So when you take drugs that shut down your immune response, your inflammatory response, you can become more vulnerable to all kinds of other downstream diseases, some of which are worse than the diseases you're treating. And so although at first uh, steroids were seen as a a dream because your pain went away, then they turned out they were a nightmare because the long-term consequences were so devastating. So autoimmune diseases in general, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, ankylosing, spondylitis, lupus, asthma, eczema, psoriasis. We just published a great paper with some really graphic pictures uh, before and after uh, with psoriasis, uh, which can be really a debilitating condition. Uh, And it's really dramatic. You you see that the changes before and after fasting with a resolution of the condition and then long-term follow if people are willing to sustain the diet, they can sustain the results. Asthma, another inflammatory related condition that responds dramatically to eliminating dietary antigens like dairy proteins, gluten, grains, and sugar. Uh, And when we use fasting, we can oftentimes bring asthma under control, eliminate the need for medication entirely. Mm -hmm. There's other conditions like lymphoma, for example, which is a type of lymph cancer. We recently published the six year follow-up on an original case report of uh, stage three follicular lymphoma in the British Medical Journal, which showed the resolution of follicular lymphoma with with 21 days of water-only fasting, and now six years followed with a whole plant food SOS-free diet. And since then, we've actually worked with a number of lymphoma patients, including stage four lymphoma with metastasis into the marrow, and the results look to be very promising. We're hoping to publish a cohort uh, with the British Medical Journal and a six-year follow-up on the original subject here later in this year. And what about other types of cancer? And I ask this because there are theories um, floating around that, um, and I'm and I don't know how well scientifically documented they are, that pretty much 
all forms of cancer is caused directly or indirectly by a inflammatory condition in the body? Well, I would say you've got to be a little careful about when you say caused by, because first of all, there's a lot of different types of cancers that have different mechanisms. There, you know, Siegfried talks a lot about cancer as a metabolic disease. Mm-hmm. And he points out that, you know, if you uh, exchange um, mitochondria, you can spread the cancer more consistently than spreading, sharing DNA. I mean, it's an interesting uh, concept. Mm. I think that most cancers are going to be associated with inflammation. It doesn't necessarily mean the inflammation is the cause. It may be yep. the result. Um, in the, what I can speak to uh, in the case of lymphoma, uh, which is a little different behavior uh, than, say, some solid organ tumors like breast cancer and colon cancer and, mm-hmm. and other conditions, uh, lymphoma responds very consistently, uh, apparently, to fasting. And you know, we're looking to do a prospective study and, and be able to prove that. But we've had enough cases now uh, to realize that you know these lesions start diminishing uh, as you start fasting. And the patients that are willing to make the dietary changes are often able to sustain uh, those those improvements. It's it's really quite impressive. Um, I don't know that you're going to see uh, as dynamic a state in in metastatic breast cancer or some other conditions. That's certainly going to have to be studied. We can't easily study that for two reasons. Number one, it's often considered unethical to do anything other than traditional treatment when a traditional treatment's been established. In the case of lymphoma, we were able to get away with that because there really is no established effective treatment. The treatment causes tremendous side effects. There's mm-hmm. not a lot of evidence that it improves all-cause mortality. And so it was con- it was not considered unethical to do stuff to, you know, get people well. Mm-hmm. In the case of other cancers where there are established protocols, it's it can be quite challenging to generate a study uh, and uh, quite controversial. In fact, I'd have to say that the paper that we published on Lymphoma is the first and only paper that has uh, BMJ has ever published, mm-hmm. and I'm sure it generated a lot of uh, criticisms. I know that uh, there there was quite a bit of discussion about uh, its publication. In fact, when we submitted the follow up, uh, it was initially rejected, even though it was an invited paper. Uh, eventually, they reviewed it and decided to publish it. Uh, so hopefully, our six year follow up won't run into any kind of resistance. Well, I congratulate you already on your work in this regard in particular, and I do hope that that the position of the scientific community on this will change and more studies and, and research will be allowed. Well, you know, those, those of us that have been looking at fasting over the years have gone from being considered criminal quacks to cutting-edge researchers because now there's there's been some interest in fasting and the idea, and Walter Longo Uh, particularly has done some fabulous work, mostly in animal studies, but now more recently in human studies and looking mostly at intermittent fasting, but certainly acknowledging the potential role of long-term medically supervised fasting. And, you know, that is what we need is is studies that really look at mechanisms and that look at clinical outcomes. And when those papers are published in peer-reviewed journals, it does tend to shift attitude. The problem is it's very difficult to get those papers published initially, because there's so much knee-jerk reaction and resistance. Uh, in mm-hmm. fact, we had trouble getting human subject committees to approve fasting because they thought too many people would die uh, as a consequence of fat. They thought people that got on a plane in New York and flew all the way to California would die if they didn't eat the peanuts. You know, they thought those <laughs> pretzels on the plane were saving their life, I guess. True. But that's starting to change. I and mean, as we were able to form an IRB and get federal-wide assurance, and so we're in a situation now we can get the studies reviewed by people that are actually familiar with the science of fasting. And that's uh, been very helpful in terms of allowing some of these uh, research projects that we're, we're doing uh, to complete. I have to say, though, you know, uh, a, a lot of the papers that have come out have only come out in the last year or two. You know, a lot of our stuff is just now uh, coming out that we've been working on for a long time. We've been doing this work since 1984. Uh, but really, you know, 80% of the stuff that's been published has been published in the last few years. So, you know, hopefully there'll be a geometric growth of that. And the one thing we do that is not uh, seen as negative is that's the people get well. We're able to normalize people's blood pressure, their blood sugar levels. We're able to resolve their lymphoma. We are able to get them out of pain and off the drugs with autoimmune diseases. There's not much out there that really makes those claims. But people that are making... Uh, claims have a responsibility to demonstrate that their claims are valid, reproducible, 
uh, safe and effective. And we, we did, for example, the first long-term study uh, on fasting safety. Uh, I should say the first study on long-term fasting uh, safety. So we, we uh, took five years, every patient that went through used the CATE criteria to evaluate adverse events and have published a safety study that concluded that fasting can be done safely and effectively if the protocol used at the True North Health Center is followed. Um, and so... Mm-hmm. And as far as you can tell, none of your patients has ever died of starvation. Well, no, none of our patients have died from anything. In fact, we have a fabulous safety record where every one of the 21,000 people that has walked in to do fasting so far has been able to walk out. And we have a strict rule that if you, know, if you walk in, you have to walk out. So we're trying not to screw up our safety. <laughs> But if you look at the safety study itself, it does a good job of looking at exactly what side effects and adverse events occur during fasting. And that categorizes them by five categories, mild, moderate, uh, medically significant, severe, and death, of course. And we've had no category five events, uh, exceptionally few category four events, Most category three events in fasting are actually hypertensive crises. Anytime a blood pressure is measured over 160, that's considered an adverse event. So if the patient comes in and their blood pressure is capped out on five medications at 220 over 120, and the next day they're down to 200, and then they're down to 190, and then they're down to 180, and the next day they're at 170, every one of those is an adverse event. Even though they're clearly getting better, it's an arbitrary standard. It doesn't have to be causally related to the event. And so If you look at our category three events, most of those are hyper, well-established hypertensive patients resolving their hypertension. And the, the bottom line is that the side effects that happen in fasting are known, predicted, expected to happen in fasting and not- And temporary. And temporary, exactly. Trans- But there are significant in the fence that when people are fasting, they don't like the, the mouth coats up and tastes like something crawls in there and dies. You may have some elimination and body odor and and, uh, skin rashes and irritability and headache. There's lots of things that happen in fasting. I call it entertainment (laughs) as the patients go through these processes of healing. But in terms of clinically significant adverse events, these are rare. And that is why, though, that long-term fasting should be done under medical supervision. Um, And, 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 you know, it's not something you want to tell people to go home and fast for three weeks continue working, take their drugs, do all kinds of things that can get them into serious trouble. Fasting needs to be done where there's been a history, exam, lab, and daily monitoring. There's there's a protocol that's followed. And if you look at our safety study, you'll see that protocol. That protocol needs to be followed to ensure that fasting can be done safely. If you don't follow that properly, if the wrong people are selected for fasting, if rest does not occur during fasting, if monitoring doesn't take place, If appropriate realimentation doesn't take place, fasting can be dangerous or deadly. There's conditions like refeeding syndrome that can be very serious. What long-term fasting followed by too rapid realimentation, well-established medical phenomena uh, of refeeding syndrome, phosphate in particular gets disrupted, electrolyte imbalance, it can lead to cardiac arrest and death. We don't see that because we follow a protocol that's well-established uh, for fasting safety. But part of that protocol is that long-term fasting be done under supervision. Now, intermittent fasting can be done safely by virtually everybody, and everybody's doing it. It's just a question of sometimes they're not doing it long enough. And so extending that fast to 12 to 16 hours may be beneficial for the vast majority. Yes, which which is uh, fairly easy to do, say, to have dinner at 6 p.m. and then not eat until 10 a.m. or even midday the next day, which, I mean, I've done it many times, it's... It, It's very easy to do. We we recommend uh, that the, it be 12 to 16 hours. There's good evidence that Walter Longo cites about supporting 12-hour fasting. There's not as much evidence yet on the 16-hour extension. Beyond that, there's a potential issue because if you continue to fast and, and force gluconeogenesis, that may become a depleting over a period of time. But for 16 hours, you you have uh, you don't deplete your glycogen stores to the point where you're going to be getting into gluconeogenesis. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you this question before we talk about the process. Not everyone can make it to your center, especially people living overseas, like I'm in Australia. I'd love to come to your center, uh, but <laughs> that that's not feasible, at least for the time being. So If someone would like to fast at home and to do longer fasting, and uh, and by, by that I mean uh, five, seven days or more, yes. uh, what 
is the recommended length of water-only fasting that can be done safely at home without medical supervision, obviously with an co- important qualifier that the person doesn't have any underlying medical uh, conditions. And uh, by the way, do you have centers in other countries, for example, in Australia? So we, first of all, we do see a lot of Australian patients. About 15% of our patients right now are from foreign countries. Okay. Um, we also offer a service. We have doctors that are experienced fasting supervisors that will work with the patient's local doctor to help them do remote fasting. So some of our Australian patients are fasting at home, but they're doing it in conjunction with our doctor and their local doctor. You okay. still have to have a history exam and lab done in order to determine if a person's an appropriate candidate for fasting. Many people that think they're healthy are not healthy at all. And they'll find out real quickly if you put them on a fast. People that are medicated, you cannot fast safely on medications. And so you have to first go through a wean down process. So what we suggest people do is the first step would be to go to our website and fill out what are called registration forms, which gets us their medical history. Then we offer a no cost phone conversation with me and I'll review their medical history and tell them, yeah, this, you look like you'd be a good candidate for fasting and then help match them up with either a facility or a doctor that can help them figure out how to do that. If they can't come to the center, obviously, you know, we we have limit, I mean, we have 70 beds, we're booked, you know, six months in advance. So it's not, we obviously can't fast everybody, but we can match them with one of our uh, telemedicine that use Skype and whatnot Mm -hmm. to work with their local doctor or a local doctor that can get them their history exam and lab and then provide them coaching to get through the process safely, uh, both the fasting and the refeeding process. Um, And so the duration depends on, you know, their history and exam. So you don't know exactly how long to fast until you see how you respond to fasting because fasting itself is diagnostic. But that means you have to, you do have to have provisions to have some support if you're going to do it safely. And that's particularly true for people that are on medications or have health consequences. Um, We also get calls from people that have undertaken fast on their own. Maybe they get into trouble and we'll try to provide them coaching on how to unwind it and how to work with their local doctors. Some of the things we do is we'll send them links to some of the scientific articles that they can share with their local doctor. Because if they go to their doctor and say, oh, I would like to fast, sometimes their doctor thinks they need neuropsychiatric consultation. (laughs) That sounds kind of crazy to you. I want you to think about this. If somebody goes to a doctor in Australia and and say it's a woman and she's lost a significant amount of weight, do you think her doctor thinks, oh, did she adopt a plant-based diet and begin exercising? No. The differential diagnosis for weight loss is colon cancer, eating disorder, or drug addiction. So most physicians become a concern if you come in and lose weight because they don't see people losing weight and keeping it off unless they're dying of colon cancer, they've become a a drug addict, or they have an eating disorder. They don't (laughs) think, oh, whole food, plant-based diet, that's not on the list of differential. They've never seen that. They don't, nobody gets well. If you have high blood pressure and you go to the doctor, they're going to take, take this one and then another, and then a third, maybe a fourth, maybe even a fifth drug. And they will promise you, you will be on drugs the rest of your life, because if you do what you're told, they will guarantee you, you'll never get well. You'll be sick forever. You'll be on drugs the rest of your life because nobody gets well. If you have type two diabetes, they won't say, oh, let's do a plant-based diet and do some fat. No, take these drugs. You'll be on these the rest of your life. We'll put them in a pump. Mm. We'll we'll take care of you. You have autoimmune disease. Here, here's your methotrexate. Here's your prednisone. You'll be on medications forever. You're never going to get well. If you have lymphoma, well, you just wait till it's bad enough and then we'll give you some chemotherapy that may not work. Very well. Absolutely. So when it comes, and the reason is these conditions are all caused by dietary excess and there is no effective pill, potion, or powder that solves dietary excess. The only thing you can do to solve dietary excess is stop overeating. And the only way you can stop overeating is to understand that you're an addict and you're caught in the dietary pleasure trap and you want to escape the pleasure trap. And it may be that fasting is a part of that. But if you don't understand what the problem is, it's very unlikely you're randomly going to come up with the right solution. (music) 
Yes, absolutely. You've touched upon uh, one very important point amongst all the important points that we're talking about that I would like to address specifically. I tried water fasting that was some years ago now and just at home by myself and managed only five days and had to stop it for various reasons. But one thing that I've noticed is that physiological hunger is not really bad and quickly goes away. In fact, I stopped feeling hunger only after a couple of days. But 48 hours. It's after about 48 hours. Yes. But the real struggle and battle that began and what I feel we have is to fight the mental hunger because food is such a big part of our life. It is a social activity, family time, comforts us in distress. It's often fun and we just love to eat. We love the taste and smells and textures of food. And of course, we eat far too much. Well, think about if you didn't. Think about what would happen if you didn't love food the way you do. Our species would never have survived. <laughs> you think we'd do all that hunting and chopping and, and chewing and, and if, if there wasn't some overwhelming driving force? It's dopamine. Yes. Food and sex, yes. that's it. Those are the normal natural stimulants of, of dopamine. And because those are the things necessary for survival and reproduction. And when you stop eating, you miss it. Absolutely. So here's my question. What is your advice? Because clearly mental hunger, I mean, that's my definition, mental or psychological hunger that I found uh, that was most difficult to deal with. What is your advice on that? And how do you help your patients to overcome that mental or psychological hunger and cravings? Well, it turns out in a, in a controlled setting, it's not a big problem because you know that's what the, one of the advantages of the True North Health Center. People come, they're in a controlled environment designed to support them. We do what we call education. I call it brainwashing, but it's education. Uh, classes that are around other people that are supportive. They're not distracted by uh, the stimulation of their previous addiction. Words, if you have an alcoholic, you don't tell them, well, here, quit drinking. But while you're doing it, go work as, as a bartender. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll make you a bartender. That'll help you quit drinking. Do you think being in a bar helps people quit drinking? No, they're constantly surrounded by all this stimulation. So getting people out of their addictive environment and all of their fellow addicts that are feeding them helps a little bit. Um, getting them away from the television and all the brainwashing and conditioning that's going on there with the advertisements and all that stuff and into an environment where they're immersing themselves with an educational model and figuring out how things work and being around other people who are supportive makes it dramatically easier. That's why alcoholics are often treated in alcohol treatment facilities for extended periods of time, because that's what it takes to make a behavioral change. You're free of alcohol, physiological cravings in a few days. It's all the other stuff that's a challenge. And that's a big part of what we're doing with fasting is we're not just not feeding people, is we're creating an environment where they can develop new skills and habits and understanding so that when they go back to the real world, they can sustain those habits. Yeah, this is very difficult business. This is amongst the most difficult thing people ever do. Adopt a health-promoting diet in a world designed to make them fat, sick, and miserable where everywhere they go, people are trying to undermine their success. In fact, a lot of times people are being told that their desire to eat healthy is a part of their pathology, that they need to learn to eat normally. <laughs> and normally means eating highly processed, highly fractionated, dead decaying flesh, junk food. And that's not normal at all, but our environment has become so perverted that we think that this type of self-indulgent drug addictive type response is normal behavior even though it's completely not. So again, if you can create a safe environment in the house where you're not constantly being um, essentially assaulted uh, by- your Empty your fridge you know, it, and pantry. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But it, you know, it, it's a, this is a lot more challenging of process. That is, when I, not the fasting, that's easy. The problem is making these diet and lifestyle changes. That's what's really difficult. Fasting itself, like you said, after a couple of yeah. days, hunger goes away. Yeah. Blood sugar levels stabilize. A lot of the cravings people get is their blood sugar levels are being balanced all around by their highly processed food. Blood sugar levels stabilize at a very low level during fasting because you're burning fat. And so there's not the up and down insulin uh, production and there's not all the cravings and that type of stuff. There is a psychological component like with all addicts. But, you know, even that goes away after a few days or a couple of weeks for most people. You did the hardest part of fasting, which is the first few days. It does get easier 
as you get farther into the process. You know, if you talk to people at our facility, they're 20, 30, even 40 days into fasting, they're going to cooking classes, they're attending lectures. You know, they're, they're not having that really difficult, like you don't want to see or be around anything the first few days. Um, and, the, and the farther people get from their addictions, the easier it is. And for example, I have alcoholic patients that are bartenders, but they're far, well enough into their recovery that they can be around it and it doesn't bother them. It doesn't take tremendous mental energy to choose not to drink. Drinking is no longer a part of their, of their personal um, yeah. environment. So even though they don't drink, they're uh, effective as bartenders. Yeah. And in fact, if you're a bar owner, you like hiring alcoholic <laughs> bartenders because they're not drinking up the profits. True. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. So let's now talk about the process uh, uh, to educate, if you like, our audience uh, on that. And and this is uh, probably the most critical part uh, because it's so challenging. And there are some good news and some bad news here. So could you please explain what happens in our body, say, with, with, if we are talking about long-term fasting, not just intermittent fasting, what happens in our body in the first, say, three to four days of fasting and how we can expect to feel? And then what happens, what changes around day five, as I understand, and then how we feel and what happens in our body, the physiological, hormonal and other levels? Well, the biggest change is your body, normally your brain burns glucose and that's your biggest burner of glucose is your brain. Also, your muscles use a lot of glucose. When you go on a fast, after about 48 hours, you've burned all your glycogen stores. There is no more sugar that's easily motivated from glycogen. The only place you can get sugar now is breaking down muscles through a process called gluconeogenesis. So in order to minimize that, you have to rest so you're not burning too many calories. And your body will now go into a process called ketosis. And particularly, it's beta-hydroxybutyric acid that's the main fuel of the brain. Now, what's interesting is that when the body starts burning uh, ketone bodies, it does other things. It enhances autophagy, the body's ability to eat up cancer cells and get rid of debris. It enhances brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is the chemical that protects the brain cells from oxidative damage, which is why people, for example, that exercise regularly and have higher BDNF levels tend not to get Alzheimer's disease. You know, Longo talked about rats, you know, they put them in a cage, everything's equal. But one rat set of rats are given a wheel so they can exercise. Those rats don't get Alzheimer's that exercise. And they realize it's because that exercise induces more BDNF, which protects the brain. Well, exercise induces BDNF and so does fasting. And it turns out if you look at all the things that happen in exercise that are thought to be healthy, almost all of those things also happen in fasting. And you might think, well, wait a second, how can that be? Fasting, you're resting. And exercise, you're vigorous. Why would they both induce the same biochemical changes, the anti-inflammatory changes, et cetera? And it may be because both exercise and fasting have one very important thing in common is they undo the consequence of dietary mm. excess. So fasting and exercise, both are getting rid of the excess fat and the visceral fat and all that stuff. And it may be that that's why we see such commonality in the physiology and the, the biochemistry that's associated with exercise and fasting. Now, I mentioned just a minute ago that you have to rest when you fast. You rest because you don't want to burn extra glucose and break down your muscles. So resting becomes kind of a critical part of fasting. And it also is important because the vulnerabilities in fasting are dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. And so where people get into trouble is they get depleted and develop electrolyte imbalance, um, get too weak, pass out, have problems or um, related problems. And so resting helps avoid that dehydration issue. And you can't just quote, drink more water because if you drink too much water, you flush out your electrolytes. And um, you know that can create a problem itself. And also just drinking water doesn't ensure that that fluid is retained in the cells. You need to have you know, appropriate nutrients that can be recycled in fasting, but just to a limited extent. And so one of the reasons why people screw up fasting at home is because they don't rest, they're, they're too active. And they think they're resting, but they're not really resting because they're watching the news and they're, they're dealing with their kids or their teenagers or their, the emergent issue that comes up. And that emotional uh, uh, innervation, as well as the physical expenditure, tends to get them depleted. And that's where they stay hungry and they, they, they have all kinds of problems. Those problems, we don't see that much once we've got people at the center because they're in a supportive environment, you know, mm -hmm. they're resting, 
they're, they, they may attend some passive classes, but they're not out doing vigorous exercise and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The other people say, well, wait, if you exercise, you'll lose more weight. You will, but you won't be losing more fat. You'll be burning more protein. And you don't want to deplete your protein source. You start to deplete protein source, you get weak, you have problems. So, you know, this is not what people want to hear. What people want to hear is you just do this thing. You can do it on your own. You can keep working. It's not going to take any effort on your part. It's perfectly fine. And when you're done, you'll have lost all your weight. And then you can go eat whatever you want to eat. And what I'm saying is exactly the opposite. It's an incredible amount of work. It's very difficult. And then you have to spend time afterwards working hard at adopting diet and lifestyle changes. And you're not going to get any support. And, you know, and particularly, I think it's even harder on women than men, you know, because there's cultural differences uh, that are more dominant. When, for example, if a woman loses 50 pounds at the center and goes back to work, do you think all of her fellow women at work are like, oh, you did so well. We're so proud of you. What can we do to support you? <laughs> no, they back and say, oh, here she comes then. <laughs> they don't search, but they're bringing you cupcakes, asking you where you're going to get your protein from, telling you it's not good to be a fanatic. Now, men have a little bit less problem because men lose 50 pounds and go back to work. And the other men don't notice. And if they do notice, they don't care. And so it has a little bit less social pressure, typically, stereotypically, on males than females. Uh, so basically, and also women, it's harder for women to lose weight because they're full of estrogen. Men are full of testosterone, which is a fat burning hormone. If you inject women with testosterone, their fat melts off but they get hairy and cancer and die. It's not a good strategy. If you inject men with the female hormone estrogen, they get fat, they get breasts, they get hips. These are biological differences. These are not psychological differences. Women are energy conserving fat storage devices, biologically speaking, because they have to store extra fat to survive a period of biological vulnerability called pregnancy. It turns out men are completely incapable of having True. babies. <laughs> There's never been a man that's had a baby. True. Only women can have babies. And that's, that ability to do that has a different physiology. And that different physiology makes it more, much more easy to gain fat if you're eating highly processed foods. And so women, I think, have a harder time in the modern environment because they're designed to store fat and they're more efficient than the males because the males didn't have to store that extra fat. Uh, and so now you have these differences where if a husband and wife go on a diet together, they don't lose weight at the same rate. The average male going on a diet, adopting a whole plant food SOS free diet, SOS stands for the international symbol of danger, and it stands for salt, oil, and sugar. Those are the chemicals that make us fat. So a husband and wife going on the same diet, husband will lose about three pounds a week, the woman about two pounds a week, about 50% less. And it's because of these biological differences. And so sometimes women feel like, I work so hard and I do everything right. He went out to in and out Burger and cheated. He's still losing weight. And I just, they say women can walk by a buffet table and gain True. weight. They don't even have to eat. A bad, a bad dream is a dress size, you know, yeah. and it feels that way, but it's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Biologically speaking, that just means your ancestors were the ones that got on the boat ride and survived for all, you know, they ate everybody else. You don't know. But they, you know, being able to store fat easily is not a punishment. It's a biological adaption that's an, an advantage, but only in a natural setting where there's scarcity. It's a disadvantage only in the modern world where it makes it easy to gain weight. Yes. In your pool of your patients, what's the percentage of uh, male versus females? 64% female. Uh, 36% male. And part of that is women have more complex uh, biology. There's more things to go wrong. They have a more, you know, they say that males biologically are basically underdeveloped females, females that didn't <laughs> fully, you know, like the queen bee, you know, that kind of thing. So I think there's more things. Which is a separate conversation. <laughs> but there's more things that we treat that, we, like, for example, we don't have, when men don't have fibrocystic breast disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, mm -hmm. uterine fibroid tumors. They don't have any of those conditions, yet they respond well to fasting. Um, and so it just so happens that many of the things that respond really well to fasting tend to be more dominant in women. Also, it turns out culturally, Women are a little bit more willing to face reality and address a problem when it arises. Men, on again, this is stereotypical, but they tend to go into more denial. And so they're, they're less willing to admit that maybe there's something yeah. to change. Um, I think women as a whole tend to be even more concerned about weight and weight management, which drives them to diet and fasting and other things of interest. Whereas male, 
you know, if it gets bad enough that, you know, it limits some important activity, then they might start to think about it. But until then, eh. and they don't pay the price uh, socially. You know, if you look at the studies, women that are overweight, they pay more to buy a car. They have more prejudice at work. They have, there's a lot of things that happen to women that don't happen to men because they happen to be storing extra adipose tissue. And so I think there's a lot of reasons why we see that uh, ratio of women to men being slightly higher. Yes. And also, I would say that women pay more attention to their looks than men. On the, Again, generally speaking. Yes. Well, that's because they, they, they're rewarded or punished more heavily based on looks. You know, there's a book by Farrell called Why Men Are the Way They Are, which is really about why women are the way they are. But it shows you that, you know, men are often evaluated simplistically by their productivity, their job, what they do. Women are often evaluated by their um, uh, reproductive potential, their looks. In other words, when you think about what, quote, good looks are, many of them are reproductive signs, waist to hips ratios, okay? Like when, when do women's waist to hips ratios approximate in nature? It's in pregnancy. And pregnant women are not fertile. So in terms of the biology of, of the male uh, desire to spread its, uh, its genes, it's going to be more attracted to a, a woman that can be impregnated than one that's already pregnant. Yes. Yeah. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Okay. So which may be a big bias about why there's a bias towards waist hip ratios of three to two, you know, it, because it's maximum fertility signs. Why do women paint their lips and, and enhance their breasts yeah. and wear it? Because these are all estrogen signs. And so higher estrogen signs, higher fertility, it activates that Attraction, trigger in yeah. the male brain that says, okay, I have a chance to pass on my DNA, whether they realize it or not, whether it's socially appropriate or not. That is, in fact, what's right, mm. whether it's humans or other animals on the planet. Uh, and women, you know, men have testosterone signs. Taller is generally seen as better than shorter, a stronger, better than weaker. And again, men are being evaluated by what's the likelihood that I'm going to be able to have my offspring survive. Mm. Is this male going to hang around? Is he going to be able to protect us? Is he going to be able to provide for us? I'm going to be more vulnerable having a baby. I, am I going to be able to get enough to eat and not get eaten? And so there's a natural, according to Farrell in, in his book, there's natural attraction. And, you know, women will support this. If you ask women, oh, they have a new boyfriend. They want to know, what does he do? Do you ask guys, oh, they got a new girlfriend. What does she look like? Yes. Okay. Because <laughs> women are largely evaluated, whether, again, whether we like this or not, they're evaluated by their reproductive potential, their attractiveness, their estrogen size. Men are largely evaluated by their ability to protect and provide. And again, it's mother you know, nature. This is kind of value judgment here. This is just biology, you know, yeah. coming through. Farrell does a good job of reviewing that in his book, and he talks about the science that supports that. And it's kind of common sense. You kind of see that pattern. You know that's true, even though we want to resist it, and acknowledging that there are those biases in society. I think it's actually empowering, particularly for women, to realize you know, what the biology of the driving forces inside themselves and other people are, because they're more likely to make rational choices that will protect them in the long run, rather than impulsive choices that are based on biology and not just psychology. So I think it's good to look at this for everybody so they make more conscious decisions about who they mate, who they marry, who, you know, what jobs they do, what careers they give up, you know, the whole reproductive cycle and potential. There's a lot of consequences that it, things are done unconsciously. And I think if they were done more consciously, you'd notice like, for example, if you look at choices women make in their first marriage, versus the choices those women made in their second marriage. Those yeah. are dramatically different choices because women, yeah, they, who they're selecting often because, you know, of what they've learned and the kind what they're, what's driving those forces. And the same thing is true, uh, uh, for, can be true for males as well. Yeah, and all this has consequences in our weight management, our approach to it, how we think about it, and to what extent we are prepared to go 
into some lengths and make an effort to uh, not just to improve our looks, but most importantly, our health, which is sort of at, on the periphery in many people's minds. The first thing is, okay, how do I look? I look fat. I want to lose weight as opposed to, okay, what is really happening in my body that is causing it? How am I feeling? Do I have a brain fog in the morning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I found the best motivating factors are pain, debility, and fear of death. I, I find patients that are really in agony and pain and not wanting to die, they're willing to do anything, even eat well. People that just want to lose weight, that can be a more difficult challenge because that's not as biologically a driving force as death and pain. The only problem with pain is once you start doing the right thing and the pain goes away, you no longer have that motivation. Yes. You know, yeah. <laughs> unless you get off track and then the pain comes back. That's why autoimmune patients are one of my favorites because they have this debilitating pain. They get well, they're out of pain. But when they start cheating too much, the pain comes back because they're not cured, they're managed. And then that forces them to comply. So I really <laughs> like that condition because it gives me a better chance for long-term adherence. Yes, and more success. So now let's let's talk a bit more about various other challenges of, in particular, longer-term fasting. For example, is bowel cleansing necessary? Does the very important intestinal flora die during the fast? And how do we need to then restore it afterwards? Also, you mentioned electrolytes. So the, this is a very, very important issue. We, you have five pounds of bacteria that live in your gut. That's a trillion creatures. These are living creatures swimming around inside your intestinal tract right now, eating, drinking, and defecating inside you. And what those bacteria poo in you could be very nasty, toxic waste like TMA, which becomes trimethylamine oxidase, which causes bowel cancer and all kinds of problems. Or they could be pooling fertilizer in you, like vitamin K, things you need to survive. So what determines what your bacteria poo in you? What you feed them. If you feed them a plant-based diet, you're going to have a thousand different strain of bacteria pooling all kinds of important nutrients into you. You feed them meat, fish, values, and dairy products, you're going to end up with a different strain, a more limited strain of bacteria that are going to be increasing your TMA levels, which is why meat eaters have probably so much more bowel cancer and other problems. So what you feed them determines what they poo, but also what kind of bacteria you get. Now, as you pointed out, when you go on a fast, there's a general reduction in bowel uh, bacteria. And then when you come off the fast, what grows depends on what you feed them. That's why refeeding after the fasting is such a critical, important part. If you refeed a whole plant food SOS free diet, you end up growing these, these uh, plant-based type bacterial flora, diverse flora that are thought to be helpful. If you go overfeed a bunch of processed crap, you're going to end up with the kind of bacteria that are associated with breaking down sugar and animal foods. So we know that restoring normal gut microbiome is an important benefit of fasting. But part of that is the careful refeeding after fasting. Now, we don't need to take probiotics or, uh, because the more important thing is prebiotics, which is the diet. And that's why diet before fasting is such an important issue. We require careful pre-feeding before you initiate fasting. And that's eating fruit, salad, and steamed vegetables only for a few days. And we also have to eliminate all medications before fasting. And sometimes that can take weeks or months. Some patients are working with our doctors remotely through Zoom for weeks or months before they come to the center to fast just to safely wean their medications so that they can get through the fasting process. Drugs that you can use feeding, even non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, common medications can be deadly during fasting, you can have kidney damage and liver damage from meds that you might get away with feeding, but you're not going to get away with in the fasting state. The fasting physiology is completely different. Many of these drugs can be profoundly potentiated. On the other hand, some of these drugs are so damaging, you can't just arbitrarily discontinue. Steroid medications, even serotonin inhibitor medications, you know, if you stop the um, antidepressant and anxiety medications too quickly, you can get rebound. Uh, problems. They deactivate the D2 receptors in the brain. So when you stop taking them, you get acute depression and anxiety. So unless you withdraw them carefully and properly, it can be uh, a health compromising process. So what about bowel cleansing during fast? Is it necessary? Well, by doing pre-feeding properly on fruit, salad, and steamed vegetables only, we, we wait until we have normally established bowel elimination before we start fasting. That eliminates the need for bowel cleansing. Remember, the bowel is outside your body. 
It's not in your body. You swallow something. It's not in your body. It's going through a tunnel through your body. It goes down the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the large bowel, and then you try to push it out the hole at the other end. It doesn't get in your body unless it gets absorbed through the intestinal mucosa, which doesn't allow anything but the smallest molecules to. A protein molecule is too big to get through that. An amino acid can get through it. Unless it's inflamed and you have gut leakage, none of that's in your body. And there's, you're designed to constantly, in fact, most stool is bacteria. If you think about it, a little bit of fiber, some stricoblinogen. So uh, cleansing the bowels, stimulating the bowels is not going to be an effective detoxification tool because that's not where the toxins come out. The toxins come out in your urine. The urine is what happens when the blood has been filtered by the kidneys. And that's where almost all of your metabolic products come out. What comes out in the bowels is all the stuff that never got absorbed. It never got in your body. It's not an active two-way gradient. You're not taking stuff from in your cells and then getting it out through the bowels. You're getting it out through the urine when the kidneys process the blood. And so we, we want to focus more on hydration than we do on stimulating the bowels. And the problem with bowel cleansing is that if you're too aggressive about that, then the bowels tend to be sluggish after fasting. So it can be disruptive to the actual process. It's also very stimulating to the autonomic nervous system. You certainly wouldn't do bowel cleansing during fasting because you'd end up stimulating an autonomic response. People would pass out, have all kinds of problems. And it's not helpful. It's not detoxifying the body. People say, well, I feel better if I bowel cleanse. Yeah, because it stimulates the autonomic nervous system and slows down detoxification. That's why you feel better. Now, is there ever a situation where an enema or colonic might be needed? Yeah. Sometimes you have people with a disease, you know, pathological process of the colon. You don't want to have residual material becoming a brick. Sometimes, rarely about 1% of the time post-fasting, despite having pre-fed properly, people get some hard stool or abstract. So you do a little enema, you do a colonic in order to deal with that. But it's an isolated therapeutic intervention. It's not a routine thing that has to be done by every. Most people, 99% of people do not and should not uh, do stimulatory bowel uh, cleansing from our viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Uh, in response to uh, fasting. Okay. Now, what about electrolytes and vitamins that our body doesn't store, such as vitamin C? Yeah, well, fortunately, you don't see scurvy in fasting patients, despite the fact they go, you know, as long as 100 days without eating. You would see scurvy if you put people on mono diets, if they were just eating, you know, bread and, you know, products like that. That's why the, the sailors used to get scurvy because they would eat bread and meat. And without vitamin C, they would uh, get scurvy. Then they learned if they took limes on the ship with them, they could suck on the lime and they didn't know what was in the lime, but they knew it prevented scurvy. That something was vitamin C. That's why they used to call them limes because they would carry these limes. But in fasting, you never see scurvy because of recycling. And also the need for vitamin C and other nutrients is reduced during fasting. The body's very efficient. This is a biological adaptation. The body's able to recycle. So we, our patients fast 40 days on distilled water only. And you, you don't see... Uh, you know, problems. Now, we have to monitor their electrolytes. If electrolyte levels get too low, then we may uh, terminate the fast and be uh, reinitiate feeding. And it's important not to supplement, for example, potassium or, or sodium in fasting, because these nutrients you can easily monitor. And they're what's called rate limiting nutrients. There are many, many things that can become limited in fasting, but they're less sensitive than sodium and potassium. So if you monitor sodium and potassium and ensure that they're still okay, you can be confident that the other downstream nutrients are okay. But if you start supplementing potassium, some other critical nutrient that you're not able to monitor could become a limiting factor. Part of the reason why we're able to do this safely and effective is we have a protocol for monitoring that involves not supplementing rate-limiting nutrients. We don't let our ignorance exceed our arrogance. And that's exactly what you do when you're talking to people often with limited experience that decide they're going to start giving pills and potions during fasting. And that's where the medical profession got into some trouble in the 60s where they did long-term supplemented fasting. And they got people to go beyond their safe regimes, end up with myocardial fibro breakdown and some other deaths and problems. That doesn't happen using this protocol. And this protocol is an unsupplemented protocol. If people become debilitated because of diarrhea or vomiting, then you can break the fast with vegetable break based uh, broths, which we make, or fresh fruit and vegetable juices, re-aliment person, rehydrate a person, and then go back into fasting once they're adequate. But generally, we can go for up to 40 days without any type of supplementation intervention, safely and effectively. Mm. Lovely. You just mentioned a moment, something very important, that, which I didn't think of up until now. You mentioned that people on water-only fasting drink distilled water. Yes. So it's not 
mineral water, it's not bottled water, it has to be distilled water. It doesn't have to be, but what we find is distilled water is just H2O, it's pure water. It's what rainwater would be if the environment wasn't polluted. Okay. And what you're trying to do with water fasting is to do just water. You're not looking for supplemented fasting. You're not looking for inorganic minerals in the in the polluted water that you're sucking out of some well somewhere. And you certainly don't want municipal water with hydrogenated halocarbons and chlorine and all kinds of cryptosporidium and God knows what else. So you just want pure water. The purest water is distilled water. Okay. And we actually carry it a little further. We make laboratory grade distilled water and we run a post filter to catch anything that might come off at the same temperature as water. And that's what people do the best with on fasting. Now you could use any highly purified water. You could use reverse osmosis. You could use, you know, there's lots of different ways to purify water. It would probably be just fine. It doesn't have to be distilled. It's just distilled is the way to get the most consistent, most reliable, pure water. That's why laboratories use distilled water. And the idea that if you're a two-way gradient, you're going to suck the minerals out of your body isn't real. I mean, you think about it. The, the minerals are absorbed from the intestinal tract. So yes, you're going to stop absorbing uh, new intake minerals, but the stuff that's in the body continues to recycle. Now you will get depletion over time. And that's why we limit the fasting to no more than 40 days. Because if you limit it to 40 days, you have a lot less complications when you're running any 60 day fast or, or longer fast than some of the guys used to do. Mm. My, the guy I trained with used to fast people up to 103 days. And I asked him why he stopped that after about 20 years. And he said he stopped it because of the sleep deprivation. And I said, oh, do they have more sleeping problems later in the fast? He goes, not the patients, me. Because <laughs> he would worry too much as they got, you know, once you get beyond 40 days, you get into more electrolyte challenges. It's a little more delicate balance. And so he would worry too much. And so he finally decided he was going to stop it at the level he knew he could get to safely with the vast majority of people. And that's where the 40 days came in. And it didn't hurt that Moses, David, Elijah, and Jesus also fasted for 40 days. You know, there's probably something to that history as well. I have people ask me, they say that we fast people up to 40 days. Do we also teach people how to part the Red Sea? <laughs> and I tell them it's all in the wrist action, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. So could you tell us a bit more about your book, The Pleasure Trap? And I have a specific question about it, especially about the SOS strategy, which stands for No Salt oil or oil or sugar in short. Now, I just would like to uh, make a comment on that. I think that most people would agree that uh, there are dangers of added salt and sugar, but oil is probably a bit more controversial. For example, coconut oil has been scientifically proven, as I understand, as having a strong balancing effect on cholesterol increasing the good cholesterol and and decreasing the bad one. And I have actually tested it and experienced it myself with amazing results, which stunned my doctor. I used to have uh, bad cholesterol levels for a long time, and suddenly they were normal. And my doctor asked me about my diet, uh, which didn't really change much. But I said, well, I have added one thing to it. Um, I I have been eating every day a very small handful, more like a pinch of coconut strips. Plus, I add to my morning protein shake a tablespoon of 100% pure liquid coconut known as MCT. So uh, in the context of your book and this particular strategy, uh, my key question is, uh, what is your argument for not adding any oils in particular to your diet? Well, just the same reason we don't add sugar. You get all the sugar you need from whole natural diet. And on this version of the diet, you get all the essential fatty acids you need, the omega-3 fatty acids to make the decosoxonic acid, et cetera. And because we're including some fat-rich foods like uh, nuts and seeds uh, in the diet. Uh, what we don't like is oil. In other words, these foods have, just like we don't like refined carbohydrates, we don't like refined oils. As soon as you break an oil down and process, you begin a, begin a peroxidation process. It also tends to make it easy to overeat on it. So if you're going to eat whole coconut, I wouldn't have as much objection. Although coconut is high in saturated fats, the studies that you cite on normalizing lipid levels, you have to understand that lipid levels themselves are quite controversial in terms of what's ideal or not. Generally, higher LDL levels and total cholesterol levels is a marker of how much animal food is in the diet. 
And the more animal food, the more inflammation, the more arachidonic acid, the more problems. That doesn't mean that artificially changing the levels by using supplementation necessarily is enhancing all cause survival or improved health. And frankly, people on these whole plant food SOS free diets tend to have normal lipid levels. So it's not a question of pushing one up or pushing another, it's just getting them healthy. But even having said that, argument against oil is just the concentrated processed nature of it. Not that you don't need fats in the diet, you do. But the fats come from whole foods, just like you don't need sugar in the diet. You get carbohydrates from the diet. And you don't need to add salt to the diet because you can get the sodium you need from a vegetable-rich diet. The problem is people don't eat much. 93% of calories consumed by people in industrialized countries now is animal foods and the highly processed pleasure trap chemicals. That means they're having to get all of their goodness, all of their nutrients from 7% of their calories. And a third of that is potatoes served mostly as French fries and potato mm. chips. Right now, mm. fruits and vegetables are the decoration <laughs> on the plate. They don't even make a statistically significant percentage of the diet of most people in our mm. society. And so then when they start doing micronutrient breakdowns, they think, well, where am I going to get my whatever? Because they're not eating any whole foods. But if you eat enough green vegetables, you eat enough healthy foods, you get the quantity and quality of nutrients you need. And we point that out in the pleasure trap, the hidden force that undermines health and happiness. Our argument is that this hidden force, that artificial stimulation of dopamine in the brain leads to a dietary addiction that leads people to overconsume the salt, oil, and sugar-rich foods that makes them fat, which gets the metabolic syndrome that is causing them to die from heart disease, cancer, autoimmune disease, and lymphoma, et cetera. And so that's the driving force behind all of this. And it's all driven by an addiction to the, to the dopamine stimulation in the brain. And it's all caused because we live in an environment where we changed our food from the only thing that was available, which was whole natural foods, to this highly processed fractionated crap that everybody's trying to convince themselves is healthy food. How true. Speaking of truth, is it correct or is it accurate, I should say, that around day five of longer term fasting, the production of the growth hormone increases exponentially, which then has a, an important role in rebuilding and restoring our cells. And also there is one important aspect that I missed in my early questions is about what I believe is called autophagy. Could you talk to this for a moment? So in autophagy, we can start with that, was uh, the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2016 was given to Yoshinori Oshumi and showed that this autophagy or autophagy was the body's ability to get rid of cancer cells and aged and debris uh, degraded cells. This is an important part of the rejuvenation process. That if you took rats, for example, and you periodically underfed them, you know, uh, uh, 60% of ad libitum feeding, or you periodically fasted them, you could double their lifespan. They live twice as long. And part of the mechanism was this increased autophagy that occurs with either exercise or fasting. So people that exercise really have a more efficient autophagy. People that fast have more efficient autophagy. So that turns out to be a big, important reason. And it may be that that might be where you get so much benefit in the rat studies and all that with the fasting is because it kicks in these natural mechanisms. And maybe it does in humans. There's still most of this research you're citing is more animal studies, not so much mm -hmm. in human. Uh, studies yet. But we do believe autophagy is enhanced and it may be why we see such rapid reduction in tumors and some of our other patients, you know, improved conditions. Also, all the acute phase reactive proteins that measure inflammation go down in fasting profoundly. If you look at CRP, uh, ferritin, pepsinogen, all kinds of mm -hmm. markers of inflammation, they almost all consistently and predictably reduce. So reducing inflammation also associated with uh, apparently beneficial health in terms of healing. But I just want to point out that although This research is active and ongoing. Much of it was based in animals. You have to be really careful in, in uh, assuming that the same thing's going to happen in a rat that happens in people. Because, for example, rats can only fast about four days and then they die. Mm -hmm. So it's human goes 70 days. So you, may, you can't always assume, well, because you fast a rat two days, that's the same as, you know, in, in a person. But uh, certainly interesting uh, benefits. What you're going to find is anything that gets rid of dietary excess is probably going to promote health. Mm -hmm. whether it's exercise or dietary change. If you change the color of your meat from red to white, uh, you may not expect wholesale changes in your health, but you still may get incremental improvement just because one thing's even worse than another. 
Something being less bad than something doesn't make it good. It just makes it less bad. <laughs> so, for example, if you drink yeah. red wine with your dinner, but eat proportionally less red meat, as bad as wine might be, it may not be as bad as red meat. So you may get some ben, quote net benefit, not because the, the alcohol is positive, but it's somewhat less negative than the other stuff. Mm, yes. So a lot of displacement and errors of attribution occur. What I challenge your viewers to do is adopt a whole plant food SOS free diet. Just do it for a month. You can expect if you're a male, you're going to lose uh, three pounds a week. So probably 12 pounds. If you're a female, you're going to lose about eight pounds. You're going to begin to detox. You're going to not like some of the detoxifying symptoms initially, and then they're going to go away. And people that do this long enough inevitably realize it's a good thing. Even those that struggle doing it because of the social issues, they realize it's the right thing. It feels right. They can see the results. There's not a big controversial debate in the people that are doing this head because they can see the results every single day. I get to see it different than most doctors do because I get to live with my patients. So we have patients there from anywhere from a week to a year. And so we can see the implementation of a carefully controlled diet and a controlled environment. We, that's why we're able to be confident that at least when the conditions we treat, we know what the results are going to be. We, you know, we have a clinic that's booked months in advance. We get to pick the people that we think we can have the biggest result with. And that's one of the reasons the doctors that we have love it there, because the people that we select are the people that are overwhelmingly likely to have good results. And so you, you can put people through just about anything. If they have a good result, they like you. You can do really nice things for people, but if they don't get well, they're not interested. So we try to cherry pick out the highly motivated, self-selected people that are going to have fabulous results. And we ask them to, you know, and try to expect them to make fundamental changes so they can get long-term results and make us look good. Yes. And also one of the uh, really fantastic um, outcomes or benefits, uh, you might call it side effect even, of fasting is apparently an incredible burst of energy. Well, at some point that may be true. Usually there's a bit of fatigue early on in fasting. People feel, uh, you know, as they adapt to using fat and and there's a whole energy conservation and metabolism slows and, you know, the body, but uh, especially mentally, I have patients that fast when they have to do challenging mental activities uh, because they find they think better uh, on an empty stomach uh, than they do weighed down with, you know, highly processed food. So, you know, there are, I have one gentleman, in fact, he's a screenwriter and he will often come to us and do a longer fast and write a screenplay fast because it's the only time he finds he's really <laughs> protective. He doesn't, you know, no other time when he has to come but to do this, that, you know, that's how he uses wow. it. So, you know, I don't know. I, I find fasting very challenging. I don't like giving up playing basketball every day. I don't like having to rest. I don't like not being able to uh, do all of my normal activities. So I find uh, fasting burdensome, but I do it every year. And because I believe that periodically fasting in healthy people is actually even more beneficial than periodically fasting in sick people that I think the people that get the most benefit are the healthy people doing preventative work. Mm. Not that it doesn't help sick people. It does. Sick people get well. It's great. Uh, but healthy people, I think, actually have the most to gain because what we're trying to do in staying healthy is not have to face the debility that comes, particularly as people age. And you'll really see it. Like I see it. I'm 63 years old. I play uh, basketball four times a week. And I'm playing with people that are somewhere between 20 and 40 years old. And as they get into their fourth decade, they're already aging out and you see them complaining and having trouble recovering. And, and you know, and what's happening is they're aging prematurely. It's not that you don't age. Of course, you're going to age. I'm getting old. The hair turns gray. You, you slow down. But it does it more slowly if you're on a health promoting diet. And so then when you see like the people that we see that are our age in the 60s and we compare, it's like, these are people we grew up with. Oh my gosh, they've aged out so much. It's like, if you look at people that are smokers, the, those that are not, you know how their faces wrinkle up, they get smokers face and they, they age out. Well, that's because the free radicals from the smoking are cross-linkaging the collagen tissue. That's what wrinkles are. It's cross-linked collagen tissue, but it's not just aging their face. It's aging their lungs. In fact, I believe that smoking actually protects against lung cancer to the 80% of smokers that never get lung cancer. The reason they don't get lung cancer is because the smoking protects them from getting lung cancer by killing them from heart disease before they live long enough to grow the tumor because it damages the animal lining of the blood vessels. And then people have heart attacks and strokes so early that it saves them from what would have they might have faced later on in their life. I wonder yeah. if they could make smoking more dangerous 
and more toxic. So everybody had a heart attack. Would they be allowed to advertise it as cancer safe? <laughs> well, very, very good point. So, uh, Dr. Goldhammer, let's now talk about your work and your programs. Now, you've got two websites that you have briefly mentioned. Could you tell us a bit more about what people can access there, how they can contact you for further advice and sign up for your programs? And obviously, I will include in the show notes all the links that that people can, can easily contact you. But could you just talk about your programs? Sure. Our research facility is a 501c3 nonprofit research facility called the True North Health Foundation. And we do public education and research. Everything's freely available. They go to fasting.org and all of our research and other people's research on fasting. is It's like a fasting compendium site. So they can get the articles. They can download the articles. No problem. Our clinic, the True North Health um, Center, if they go to truenorthhealth.com, they can fill out the registration forms. And then they can get a free phone conversation with me to at least try to point them in the right direction, either to the right doctor or discourage them from doing something that might be stupid or get resources to them so that they can have. And there's no cost for that. We also have doctors through our telemedicine practice where they for a fee, they can actually work with a doctor who will review their medical history, who will give them advice and coaching and and work with their doctor if necessary uh, to help them make good decisions. Um, the website also has uh, all of our articles, as does the other site, but it also has video clips. We also have a free Roku channel, True North Health, uh, that uh, a lot of our content, uh, is, it's all freely available. Uh, they can even log in through our website and look at our lect- so part of our education program at the center, freely available, uh, live streaming. I speak Monday afternoons. They're able to log mm-hmm. in and join us for that. Um, for people that want to do medically supervised fasting, if they can't come to the center, we can try to point out whatever the closest place mm-hmm. to them is. Unfortunately, the place in Australia, um, Dr. Burton passed away. And so there, there isn't an active medically supervised water fasting site. Yeah, but hopefully one of these doctors we're training will open up mm-hmm. a place. We do have an active residency training for physicians. Doctors that want to do something worthwhile with their life and learn how to get people well, Our foundation pays for them to come. We provide room, board, and training at no cost to the doctor. And we will teach them how to do fasting supervision, how to use this diet appropriately. uh, And they work as a resident in the facility uh, until they're comfortable to go back home and hopefully carry this on. And we do have doctors now that are opening Mm -hmm. up facilities that we've trained that are able to do this. It's really um, low-tech, very simple intervention because all we're really doing is fasting, and then refeeding and allowing the body to heal itself. There's not a lot of procedures or things that have to be done, Um, but it does take some experience to be able to differentiate a healing crisis from a problem. A lot of physicians are so, they've never actually seen people get well before. You know, that's not something they're used to. And so they're not used to seeing what lab or what the physical presentation looks like in a person that's actually getting well. They're used to suppressing the symptoms of disease with drugs. They're experts at that, but has nothing to do with getting well. Well, Dr. Goldhammer, thank you so much for for this amazing conversation. And you are the fountain of knowledge and experience of such an important topic. It's been an absolute pleasure. I will, of course, include all the links and all the information in the show notes. And I hope that uh, this conversation will inspire many people uh, many of our listeners to go ahead and try water fasting or or contact your center, get more information, get educated, get informed and discuss it with the doctor. And please, please share this podcast with your medical practitioners. Send a link to your doctors if you feel that uh, that they might be interested in in getting training at, at, at Dr. Goldhammer Center. Because once again, it's not only excellent information and important information for people as patients, but also for the medical profession. So I would encourage everyone to please send a link to your doctor. <laughs> yeah, while they're doing that, send them, send copies of the articles. That yeah, and copies, in the yeah. Literature. Because if you share the studies, that they understand how difficult it is to publish yeah. research papers in these, in these main big impact journals. And so they understand what that means. And if you share the articles, then sometimes they'll think you're not so crazy because you're looking at something like this. Because it does sound yes. a little hard to believe that you could do nothing 
safely yes. and that it would work. I mean, it doesn't, it's, it just sounds too good to be true. Yes. And you sent me those links and I will post them on in the show notes so the people can access them and, and most likely more through your, through your website. So I sure, will that's include the links to your, to your both websites as well and your social media. Any final comment or message that you would like to leave our listeners with? Yeah, health results from healthful living. You want to be healthy? You got to focus on diet, sleep, and exercise. And if you can figure out a way to not eat three to four hours before you go to sleep at night, you can add that intermittent fasting in safely and effectively. And if you if you're diligent with it, people don't come back and say it wasn't worth the effort. They say it's the best thing they ever did. Absolutely, very well said. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldhammer. I much appreciate this conversation. Thank you so much, and thank you for doing this work. By the My way. Pleasure. Uh, and congratulations on your amazing results so far. And there will be many more and, and, and even greater in the future. So thank you and all the best. Very good. Good night. Lovely. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes and other podcast info, please go to my website at quantumliving.com.au forward slash podcast. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.